Welcome to Ethereum Hot Takes number 11. Um, apologies for our, our absence on Tuesday, but we are, we are back at it. Um, today we have a, a, another very special guest, Mr. Johnny, uh, one of the, the best designers and probably musicians in the space. Uh, wow, all right. Also, also Joy, we were also, <laughs> we got Robbie back on and he's, he's operating the soundboard today. Um, this is entirely an experiment. I don't think he knows what any of the sounds actually are. So he's just going to like click random buttons and could be entirely out of place, but we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, today we're going to be talking uh, a little bit about identity and, or, or sorry, <laughs> misspoke. We might talk about identity later, but we're going to be talking a little bit about design. Um, and it, <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> we're going to be talking about design and its role in the Ethereum space and the Web3 space more broadly. Um, if we have time, we'll, we'll dive down the identity rabbit hole and maybe talk about how design plays a role in identity. Um, and before we go, go ahead and get started, Johnny, do you want to just give a, a brief background and introduction to yourself? Yeah, um, so I got into the space, I think around 2015, doing thesis research on, you know, for my design masters and, uh, you know, researching kind of like the intersection between the field of design and like these new advancements in uh, these types of technologies, just like what on the cutting edge was gonna change the way uh, our experiences online um, happened and blockchain seemed to be like one of the most important new technologies. There was other things I was considering at the time, AI, VR, things like that. But like um, blockchain just fundamentally seemed like it was going to change the nature of like, you know, we always talk about it, trust on, on the internet. And that felt like the most like interesting thing um, to, to explore. Um, and so I did that work, then went to IBM. I was one of the kind of first designers on the IBM blockchain team when they're building Hyperledger Fabric. And I worked on uh, their Maersk project, which is like Trade Lens now and Walmart Food Safety. And uh, worked with a few other people there that are now at Consensus or have been at Consensus. And then came over to Consensus about almost three years ago and started into the identity space and have been doing that since. Awesome. Yeah. And I actually, I, I previously worked with Johnny a little bit when I was on, uh, we were both on the Uport team, uh, yep. which was Consensus's self-sovereign identity spoke. I don't know if that brand is that, is Uport still a, a brand? It's still a live brand right now, but you know, with some of the recent, uh, you know, reorgs and stuff, we might just become, uh, you know, a different name that maybe is more aligned with the rest of like the Consensus brand. Um, and, uh, but we'll see how that shakes out. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's kick it off. So this, this might be a little bit too high level of a question, but I feel like you're going to have a, an interesting answer to it because I feel like this is the way you think. And I love the way that you think, um, what, what is design? Yeah. So, I mean, that is very high level. It's a, it's a, I think, I don't think there's one definition, right? Everybody has, every designer probably has their own kind of personal definition. I tend to take like a really broad view of what design is. Um, and design's really just about, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe you would call it, it's an approach to solving problems, right? So not all approaches <laughs> uh, rely on the same assumptions or philosophies as you walk into trying to solve a problem. Um, and design is one that typically, like if we get into like the type of design that I believe in that's best, like human-centered design or user-centered design, essentially what that is is saying, we're gonna reason at a first principles level, we're gonna reason from the person first, what their problem and experience is, and then we're gonna work kind of backwards from that. I always like to think of like design Design's a philosophy, design's a process, design isn't a, a thing, design isn't an output, um, design is uh, an approach to solving problems. And so like, we always do this at IBM. Um, uh, we used, I used to work with another great designer, also former uh, Meshian, Sarah Mills. And we 
you know, she introduced me to IBM's like design thinking. And there we always, there was one thing that I still use here in a lots of conversations, which is like the as is and the to be scenarios, which is what is the state of the world as we understand it today? And what is it that, what is it that we want the world to be for this person, right? And then let's work backwards from that. The hard part about being a designer in the blockchain space is that you're coming into all of those discussions with an assumption that blockchain is somehow relevant to this person's problem. And this is always like a careful dance for designers where not everything, not all solutions are on the table, right? Only the ones that, <laughs> you know, uh, require a blockchain, right? And so if you were going to go talk to somebody like at IDEO or something like that, or like a lot of this stuff was, um, I don't know, like they push design and human centered design forward a lot. Um, and if you were to talk to them, I think most people would tell you that the real way to do design thinking and human centered design is to go in with no preconceptions over what might solve their problem, right? And if it ends up being a blockchain, great. If it ends up being some like manual service, great, right? And that is being truly human centered. So. Point is, design also to in, in the blockchain space is kind of this like tough little, you're trying to be human centered, but you also have these competing incentives where you're, you're, you're a blockchain company or you're working on a blockchain project, right? And you kind of have this like, you got to you gotta somehow uh, keep that bias at bay. And that's, that's super interesting. So, I mean, because I, I, I truly believe that, you know, blockchain as a, you know, technology is going to permeate kind of all aspects of the world that when we talk about like what the state of the world is, and I, I love this statement, like what we want it to be for like that person in the future. I feel like when anytime you have that conversation, it's almost like you have to at some level incorporate blockchain. It's like talking about what the future state of the world looks like for a person without the internet. Like any, mm -hmm. any specific thing you talk about, like should incorporate the internet or computers into that equation because I don't know, like even just me making a cup of coffee that that in now involves technology. And so I, I view kind of blockchain the same way um, that it's because it's going to permeate everything. Like it's like a tool in the arsenal of designing the future for people. Um, mm -hmm. Do did, did you have you? found that to be the case or have you found it to be difficult to kind of design with needing to include blockchain as a solution in your designs so yeah there's like a, one one thing is like even for designers you can't really solve a problem um you can only really address a user's problem with the tools that you're aware of right you can't know what you don't know right so for for you know if you're a designer and you're not in the blockchain space and you go to some situation where uh, the people there are having trouble um, you know doing something with money you know getting uh, you, you look at you know, collapsing economies how do I get our you know or do remittances or something like this right if you don't know that blockchain exists and is an option to you which you probably didn't know about if you were a designer in 2009 or 2010 or 2011 I certainly was a designer back then trying to do startups and stuff and was not thinking about using these technologies in these ways and that that they could solve these problems uh, those don't ever get passed on to being potential solutions for the people you're solving for so I think designers need to like know what's at their disposal um, and not just designers I'll, another little caveat to my definition of design is that like because design isn't as much of a trade as people think it is it's not just color theory and fonts and everything like I expect lots of people lots of teams to take design driven approaches in which everybody knows how to design right like how to approach problems in this way right so I don't think you have to be designers um, necessarily to do design um, anyway point is you have to you have to know what tools you can use right um, and so designers should be aware of those things and then two I agree with you that and another I think it's been at least in vogue and I don't think either any of us on this call are this type of person, but it's kind of in vogue to like be a skeptic, right? Of, of blockchains. Um, and 
you know, like that we're using blockchains on this, that, and the other thing, and they're not needed to do anything. I mean, this is the most prevalent ideological, like bias by the Bitcoiners out there, right? That blockchain is just money and they're, they hate that term, like, you know, blockchain, not Bitcoin or whatever it is. Um, and uh, I am like the complete opposite of that, right? Because I see blockchains as being like this fundamental trust coordination thing. And lots of the problems that we've been solving and then we improve them over and over again, I feel like if we have the shot at solving them almost like once and for all or once for a long time because we solved it with blockchain because lots of the problems, their roots are in these things around trust. Um, and we've only been able to address higher level problems that are manifestations of those problems at the trust level. And, you know, those are things like building a faster coffee maker and one in which you can monitor your coffee maker remotely and all of these things. And those problems are all like, kind of like easier problems, you know, I feel like, and, um, I just think that we're running out of easy problems to solve. The ones that are left are the deep ones, right? That blockchain is going to try and address. So like, you know, yeah, maybe blockchains aren't needed for a coffee maker. Sure. Right. But for all the problems that it seems like we care about these days, uh, blockchains seem pretty well positioned better than any other technology. Like, I don't know what else anybody else is planning on doing to solve them. Um, if they're not going to use a blockchain to do it. Right. I yeah. mean, I, I see these like supply chain, fake news, um, immigration to a certain extent. I mean, these things all get in, we can talk about identity later and how it relates to all this, but like a lot of that, I'm like, yeah, blockchain could potentially do something there, you know? Yep. And, and I view, I've almost come to, on the, on the point of like skepticism, it doesn't, I don't understand. I mean, I, I, I understand how people can be skeptics if they're not well informed, but if you are an informed person and you're still a skeptic, I, I really don't understand that mindset. And I, I, I kind of view blockchain as less of like a tool in a person's arsenal and a new law of physics that we've invented that we have to play by, like we can now play by the rules of, and it like changes the rules of the game. Like fundamentally, if you have this like root trust layer, that you like where you, where you can have um you know like distributed participants coming to agreement on a single state of the world or a common belief in a set of things so i i just like to me it it's like this it's almost like an overlay on re <laughs> this is going to get weird and philosophical but like it's like an overlaid law of physics on reality at like the tech it's at the technological layer that just like permeates kind of everything. And, um, yeah, I don't yeah. know. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm there with you. I think that, um, it, I mean, because I don't look at blockchains as like these technical advance as, as technical as lots of people in this, they are a technical advancement, but they are, it's really a, it's a social thing, right? It's 100%. A getting yep. people to agree on the state of something, right? And that's yep. just like, it's because people don't agree in real life on the state of these things, right? They have disputes and we, and, and, and solving that problem allows us now to address something that we took for granted in every other product design session that we've ever done previously, which was like, that there that that we just had to take it for granted that you know that couldn't be done that the trust problem is just something not to think exactly. about because like uh they're just gonna have to trust some centralized company that's just it that's just the backstop of the whole discussion right but now that door is open and um yeah so i, I mean i think it, and, and it's there is no there's very few like the only times where I think blockchain is completely irrelevant is if you have like a single actor system, right? With like, I'm going like a, like a coffee pot, right? Which is like, I, it's just me and the thing. But in time you have an, a multi-actor system, which is increasingly what the internet is, right? 
now a blockchain immediately starts making sense. Now maybe it's yep. benefit or marginal. It's just like not worth the cost to offset the risk. But if it costs you nothing to implement a blockchain to these systems, I really have a hard time seeing any downside if you could just snap your fingers and give them, yeah. make them on blockchain. And I, I think we're just going to have less and less single actor systems as um, this kind of interoperable, composable world emerges. Because, yeah. um, I mean, even, even with the basic example of a coffee pot, it's like, what if your coffee pot, like, talked to your house and it, like, knew when you were going to wake up and then it made the coffee for you and then it ordered the beans from Amazon when you're getting low. And so, like, even your coffee pot becomes, like, not a single actor system. It starts needing to interface with all these other parties. And in that world, like, this interconnected world that is going to emerge, I don't think right. that, like, it's, yeah, I, I don't Maybe. see Maybe we'll get coffee pots that run a standardized, you know, kind of protocol across like all the hotels and, and lobbies. And then you'll be able to get your coffee at any of those coffee pots. Dude, I like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> Robbie, sorry for interrupting. Go. Oh, no, no, you're good. But, I, but to, to bring it back a little bit to like reel in from like the high philosophical level to more of like the design, a little more granular. If we look at maybe like web two as it stands right now, and we can break it up into perhaps like three functionalities of, or three categories, you have functionality, you have technology and you have design patterns. And these three things are going to kind of create web two. And I know that when it comes to like design patterns, you can talk about like trending UI, uh, glossy veneer that kind of goes over these, you know, uh, applications or, or, or websites. How difficult do you think adopting some of these, if you think it's even worth adopting perhaps three of these components into web three looks like, like what are some of the hurdles going from, uh, designing in web two to designing in web three. Yeah. So like, I think that this is, um, maybe, uh, comes, comes the, the thing that comes to mind is, you know, uh, civil, let's take civil's token sale. Um, now new is, was uh, one of the lead designers at civil and she now works with me on identity as well as a number of other people. But, um, we talked about this a couple of, a couple of times. And so the thing that I noticed when Uport did research on things like onboarding and whatnot into the space, um, the, the UX, what is perceived as one goal for a new user, they want to apply to the civil registry, you know, and for anybody out there, civil was a newsroom platform. They want to combat fake news and ownership of, 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 of content and things like that, a decentralized newsroom type of thing. Um, but if you wanted to stake on the, the, uh, the civil registry, and you want to do it because you're into news and you're into journalism, right? And that's the type of user we have to get into Ethereum, right? They use the internet, but they don't, they're not getting into it because they're into DAOs or TCRs, right? They, they actually found Civil's mission and their ideas around how they were going to solve it compelling, right? But I forgot what their like drop off rate was somewhere like, I don't know, 80s, 90s per percent after clicking like start this process, like, you know, apply to the newsroom or fund or whatever. And that's because the UX of like one goal in that case for a civil user takes you through four different applications of none of which are collaborating directly on that flow. Right. But the user doesn't see it as a, you know, fundamentally different flows. It's just all part of the same thing. So like, Mapping it out, uh, I think was like 54 steps that went from the civil like marketing site to Coinbase, waiting a couple days, getting your ETH, getting MetaMask from the Chrome store, sending your Coinbase ETH to MetaMask, going to Token Foundry, taking the quiz stuff there, then depositing your ETH you know, via token foundry and then receiving the civil tokens. KYC in there and stuff too. Yeah. And <laughs> Maybe we don't do those sound noises anymore. <laughs> <laughs> to the, 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 then receiving the KYC or the, uh, the tokens, the civil tokens 
to your MetaMask and then going to the MetaMask registry experience and sending the civil tokens to the civil registry contracts and then finally getting your success that you've done it, right? And that is a problem obviously because the UX is fragmented and um, I think that we're going to have to have like, Centralized systems have centralized UX and web two centralized applications can control every step of the way. And we just can't do that if the world we want is a decentralized web. Um, so uh, yeah, there's gonna be, I think that's the biggest hurdle. So like some things that I'm, you might see, like you might see things like what we were doing here at Consensus, which was like that Rimble design system or something like that that needs to get adopted in the same way that protocols get adopted, like the Ethereum code gets adopted, like Solidity and, and, and um, uh, well, not Solidity, but using Solidity to interact with the EVM and smart contracts as a, you know, there's a spec and everything for that. Um, the way that gets adopted, we might see UX designers go that same route where standards have to be adopted at the UX level. Sure. Dude. Would you say that like um, when it comes to the bleeding edge, one of the biggest hurdles for a designer is just like that design consistency across viewports uh, across like, can you speak on that? Yeah. I mean, this gets to it relates to trust, right? People just, you know, like, they don't when when something's bouncing you around to multiple sites you assume as i think you assume as a user that that the site you just came from doesn't know what you're doing over here on this next site right and it doesn't know the next site that it sends you to doesn't know and so you don't really when you trust the first site you kind of know that there's no reason to because you trusted the first site to keep that same level of trust just because they sent you to another site and that site sent you to another site, right? Like there's no, you trusted one person to hold your hand through this process, right? And uh, to handle your money. And now they're asked, they're passing you off to a bunch of their friends who you don't have relationships with and you don't know what their mission statements are. And they were not the ones that put, put their hooks in you for why you're even here, right? And that, um, that just breaks, uh, you mean you lose something in every one of those transfers from one application to another, you lose some amount of the trust in the system, and at least on the user side. Now on a technical level, you might say in a lot of these cases, no trust is lost, right? It's all trustless, right? But at a user level, um, I think that that's ultimately like, it just, I think it just decays that trust, level of trust from the first application where you initially start your experience decays will much quicker than us in the crypto field think it does for regular people. Yeah, that's such a good point. And I, I never really thought about that, but like in this ecosystem of composability, like each of these composable Lego blocks of the, you know, the ultimate Lego structure currently has its own like design patterns and its own feel. And to the, to a user who's not, not well versed in, in web three, who doesn't really understand like the principles principles behind it like they might not trust like each of these individual flows so like i think that is that is such an interesting question to think about how how we solve that because i think it does have i think it has to at some extent happen at the design level like do you think that something like application conglomerates could emerge where you know let's say if you're operating in the financial services ecosystem you join the financial services conglomerate and conform to the financial services design standard so all of this mm -hmm. stuff kind of looks the same or yeah so i mean yeah that'll it'll be interesting how it shakes out but um yeah i mean i think it's clear that people want centralized experiences and they and, and when i say centralized experiences i'm talking about like uh, it's really just consistency, right? And n no unknowns, right? And, um, but, and that's, and, and, and largely that's why Web2 has been successful and we see a trend towards centralization over time on the internet. And uh, we haven't seen as much unbundling as we thought, but like, I think 
that is what users want. And we're trying to thread, we, I think there, there's a implicit assumption in everybody who's working in this space, at least, or at least a lot, which is we can decentralize the infrastructure um, and hopefully still provide competitive centralized feel. Can you have a centralized feeling experience with completely decentralized infrastructure? I think you can. I don't think we're very close, um, which would bring me to another hot take, honestly, um, about where our priorities are in this ecosystem. But like, um, yeah, I think, I think that's what we have to do for it to be successful. Like, if we aren't going to do that, or we don't think we can do that, then we and Ethereum won't be much better than Bitcoin. We'll still just be money rails that do pretty basic stuff that the financial industry already does um, a lot of faster and everything. I think what's going to happen is when we have new novel experiences uh, on crypto that can't be replicated anywhere else. Like, um, and those things won't take off until they feel like they're like these centralized experiences that have all the great UX, but are novel use cases that only can exist because they're decentralized. Yeah, very well put. I would be, I feel like we were close to getting a hot take out of you. <laughs> I'd like to push on that a bit. Like, so how, what would, what's your hot take on reducing user frustration with Web3? Well, I mean, my, well, one, I think that, I guess like there's two kind of opinions I have here. One is, and I don't think this one is that controversial anymore, but I am not like a, in a way I'm a decentralization like purist. I very much believe in it, but I just don't believe it's the starting point, right? Like I'm pragmatic in the sense that you have, I, I think it's totally fine to lead your user down a path that begins centralized and you have designed over the life cycle of them being a user of your product, how to move them more and more decentralized over time, right? I think we see this pattern like, uh, you know, I, I think it's fine if you use something like a burner wallet and you get money for the first time and they're really not, you know, the keys are just generated in the browser storage or it's like even the money or the keys are held in cloud storage by the application or something. And they then once you have, you know, 10, 15, 20, whatever that line is, we'll figure it out. They nudge you to, you know, manage your keys somewhere else and they maybe nudge you to then set up your social recovery a couple weeks later and then they nudge you to even be running your internet at some point on like whatever it is like a mesh network like i think we can nudge people but like everybody's solving their own little narrow problem and like uport is uport is uh you know has done this right we we went like super decentralized maximalist at the beginning right like we were going to do social recovery right off the bat and like you know you're getting to see your did and um, all of this stuff and i actually don't hate like the idea of like it's fine if you're you start at coinbase and then move to coinbase wallet and then move uh, i think i think so i think that the that progressive decentralization or progressive sovereignty is the way to go except yeah. that nobody's designing their products to think about how are we going to progress the user from centralized to decentralized I they're think it's point on that spectrum and saying that's where they're going to be. I think it's a matter of like both holding their hand and providing a, a reason that where it's explicitly necessary for them to take that next step towards decentralization. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you look at, I'd say a majority of people who have bought crypto so far, I assume most of them still just, they had a, they have a Coinbase account, they bought their Bitcoin on Coinbase and it just sits there. And like, even though maybe everyone in the space is like, hey guys, not your keys, not your coins, or mm -hmm. hey, you really need to get a hardware wallet. I guarantee you a huge percentage of people just leave their stuff in Coinbase. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's kind of totally fine. But let's say you want to start interacting with DeFi. Well, mm -hmm. then you really need to go get MetaMask. And so mm -hmm. then you need to take your coins from MetaMask and or from Coinbase and, and put them on MetaMask. And so like, I think we need kind of these explicit for forcing in, in addition to design, I think we need to like make the, make the path super easy and show them the roadmap for doing it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's where the design comes in, but we also need to just think about 
um, like these more explicit for forcing functions that require people to trend in the direction of decentralization. I think you talked about a little bit before, bit before. it's like new things that were not previously possible with centralized systems. Like mm -hmm. as we start to develop these, these unique use cases that are only able to be, be addressed through decentralization and through blockchain, like that's where we're going to start seeing people really going down the decentralization rabbit hole. Yeah, and I, I think one of the problems here to getting this to happen, unfortunately, is a little out of our hands. I think like, you know, there's a whole regulation piece. Obviously, like the great thing would be for somebody like Coinbase to do more work in pushing people, even though they come onto their centralized exchange and they're custodianing their money, you know, it would be great if there was more avenues in their user experience that offloaded those people that have this money now into interesting decentralized experiences. But yeah. I don't, I'm not sure that they're really allowed or wanting to be doing a lot of that because the rules are still like, that's a really good point. Yeah. Uh, you know, like they're facilitating, who knows what they're they're who knows what they'll be accused of facilitating. Right. Um, so yeah, in, in lieu of that, like, I don't know. Like I, I look at other like apps that could be doing this. I mean, it's, it's like hard, like I don't want to critique another designer's work explicitly. Like they might have their own goals and all that stuff. And I don't know much about their companies, but like I see, you know, I was looking at Audius um, and which is like, you know, uh, music streaming, uh, decentralized music streaming and stuff. Right. And they abstract all the crypto away, easy web to style sign up. But like I'm wondering, like once you're on there, that can't be the end of it. Like if that's just the end of it, where you've abstracted all the crypto part away, it's hard for me to understand what the user is getting out of it being even underneath the surface anyway, right? Like they don't, if they don't know it exists and they're just getting a SoundCloud or Spotify-like experience, then like what is the point really? Um, and I'd be interested to see if they can push them to managing their own keys after they've been an audience user for a while. Right. And like that type of thing. Right. So, um, so yeah, I think that there are some places where we can still make progress on this. Um, I just think the easiest one is like the one it comes back to is just like, it, and I guess it's part of all of these progressive decentralization models is just, it's, it comes down to like a lot of it is key management, right? Like, I think we have clear steps, right? So you have like something like Fortmatic that like has the keys for you. They can easily move you then to seed phrases or writing it down or like cloud backups all the way over to something like uh, Argent and social recovery. Like I haven't seen an app implement a user journey that starts at one place and makes you, gets you all the way over to there over time, right? With Argent, you just start with social recovery, right? Like that's, you don't even get your seed phrase. And um, so, I don't know. I think that there's intermediate steps that we're just like ignoring. Yeah, and and I've, I wanna go back a little bit. I, I have a, kind of an important question I wanna ask you. So um, you said that like people want these quote unquote centralized experiences or experiences with no unknowns. Mm -hmm. um, like currently when even when i'm interacting with a dap i don't really know what i'm signing <laughs> like i get i get the metamask pop up and it's like this thing wants access and i'm like okay i kind of trust that this is a trusted application in the ecosystem and i'm willing to click connect or i'm willing to send this amount of ether or do this transaction and <sighs> I still get a little bit scared when I do stuff on mainnet because I don't really know what's happening. And I feel like that's, I was going to bring that up. I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you, do you think anybody sending a significant amount of money in Ethereum does it with no even tinge of like apprehension in their stomach? No, I don't think so. Except maybe like, Christian Lundquist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I can guarantee you nobody, I would be willing to bet that nobody that's not a developer in this space does that without feeling totally. some type of way. 
Yeah, we were even I when we so we built mesh hub for the mesh and it was totally on Rinkaby and people were like hesitant to interact with Rinkaby because they didn't understand how that works and they were like, oh, I might lose my mainnet ETH on this account if I interact with stuff over on Rinkaby. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. It, yeah, yeah. I mean, if that's a, if that's happening at consensus, we are so far. From, yeah, we're so far. <laughs> right, and um, and so yeah, like I I totally agree with you. I think like uh, I think that the unspoken, or maybe it's an unconscious bias, but um, most people in the space, a lot of their what they claim is the trust or what they feel like is trust in the tech and the system is trust in the community and the people because they know everybody who built it. hundred percent. Yep. And I don't, and, I, honestly, I don't know if we can ever get away from that because even at like the lowest level and I, I think we're, we're, we're moving away. What we're doing is moving our tr trust from the like, political elites and over to the technocratic elites who are like mm -hmm. the developers um yeah. i think this is a better system because one i think those people have like you know maybe better values at the moment and mm -hmm. two it's like a playing field that anyone can participate in um so like anyone can technically become a developer and start you know diving into the code if it's open source whereas if you're playing this political game and, and you're establishing this political trust it's like a closed garden like it's a wall garden that you have mm -hmm. to not everyone can make it into regardless of how skilled or how smart you are so mm -hmm. i think this is a better system but it's still ultimately reliant on, on humans yeah and uh yeah this brings me to like I, it was funny because the we were talking before we got you know started recording and you know the, i watched the um, uh podcast y'all did with evan and um you know both of us are both Texans, but I think we, we, I think I noticed that we differ on is like, I actually am not quote unquote bearish on on chain governance. Like, I think that, and this kind of the reason I think about this is because of um, what you were saying about, you know, we're putting our trust in devs, right? And um, I, I think that the, if we, if all the like the, the high minded goals, like, I don't see how they matter with off-chain governance, right? Like how does off-chain governance, given enough time and complexity, not just become the governance we know of old, right? Like, but with different different people, right? And so that's that's uh, that's maybe one of my controversial opinions. Like I think that I think that if Ethereum, I look at it, the reason I like Ethereum is because I look at it as a coordination and social consensus mechanism is supposed to help us agree on things. And and if it and if we can't use it to make decisions about our system, I'm worried that like what can it do if it can't do that, right? Like um yeah, I don't know. There's something there that bothers yeah. me about like this whole thing is trustless and everything except for the root of it isn't right. Like we call the, we call the Bitcoin 21 million coin uh, cap a scam because we don't trust their governance model and it's not on chain for anybody to look at. It's not transparent, but then again, how is ours? Right? Like, so that's a, a thing I think about a lot, which is wow. like, we gotta get we gotta get both you and Evan on, on the next one and just like hash that out because that is a super interesting topic. Um, my quick hot take on on chain governance and like this top gen topic generally is uh, like I think that on chain governance down the road once we are much more well studied and well versed in the proper governance of systems totally makes sense. I mm -hmm. think that what we're seeing with Ethereum at least is the governance mechanism is so complex because you have so many actors in this decentralized system like having their input and you kind of like, I don't know if we can necessarily like map, the, like we can't come up with some sort of concrete mathematical model that would get us as optimal solutions as you know like we as humans can 
if, if we are objective yeah. and neutral in our analysis of the ecosystem can derive. And so maybe once we have like super powerful AI and machine learning and stuff like those things can come up with like proper on-chain governance mechanisms. I think that makes sense. But right now I think um, it's almost like short-sighted to think that we can be like, we can set something in stone and be like, you know, if this happens, then this happens. Yeah. If the, if the response on chain governments is yes, but it's too soon, then I'm in agreement, right? Cool. Like, I don't think it should be, we should have on chain governance tomorrow, but I'm thinking like, I don't know. I feel like people will say that it's just fundamentally not even desirable, right? Like, but like, and that's a, that's where I'd split. I'm like, I don't know if it is possible to do it in a way that is obviously ethical and inclusive and transparent and all the things we would want. Makes total sense. Then why would we not aim for that? Because I don't see like the reason people, the reason a lot of us don't trust all the other chains is because of the governance problem. <laughs> right. And no, yeah. Yeah, so like, of course people that don't trust ours, right. Like, or a lot of people don't. Right. That is dude. I, I just want to touch on that really quick. Like that is why I am an Ethereum maximalist is only because of the governance process of Ethereum. I think it like there are extremely intelligent people who are all in it for the right reasons governing Ethereum and they're very flexible in their assumptions and their design and their thinking and the technology they're willing to use. And so because of that, Ethereum is like extremely adaptable and flexible. And so that that's like the main reason why I'm so bullish is because Ethereum just like adapts to everything because it has such good as crazy as it as it is and how as unstructured as it is it has in my mind the best governance right now right but would you would you think that if you didn't know any of these people involved in governance it's a good question yeah <laughs> so probably and, not and yeah. any person coming into the ecosystem has to take yeah. your word for it that's right? such a good point yeah. so, <laughs> maybe that's why people like tron because they don't understand who like justin sun is yeah well yeah exactly i mean sure and lots of people like xrp because wow. they don't understand the governance model right because it, but like it really i do think that yeah just i don't know i i i it makes me sad to think that we're not even we're already kind of like lots of the smartest people in the space and who have some of the most power in the space, I see them writing it off and saying, acting like it's not even a priority or can't be done when I feel like it's an existential question. Um, so yeah, it's probably one of the most important questions. Like now that I'm just like thinking about a little bit more, like, <laughs> and if you're not wanting to try and solve the governance problem and you think off chain governance are just, is, is, you know, like, I don't know, good enough or fine that's probably because you're part of the in crowd like no like i'm a relatively technical designer right but like i don't feel like i have hard enough times in the crypto space getting people to to think outside of the bubble and think about the people the other stakeholders right like even on even on individual projects it worries me like that the entire foundation of the new world is not like even interested in gathering the perspectives of its constituents, right? Like that, <laughs> you know, um, that's, uh, that's a problem for me. And I, and honestly, because I know that, um, our off chain governance process is relatively transparent, right? But it is still opaque to anybody who doesn't use GitHub regularly. <laughs> you know so yep. that's you know it's, a, it's and just i don't a, i don't feel like i could have a say in anything that goes on like maybe right. i could talk to some people who have a say but personally i can't just like go in and, and influence anything right yeah and and um you really have to take a design approach to this which is how it's not it's not like there's this like um this is a big thing that's pervasive in in design especially by like non-human centered designy people, which is like, they believe the onus is on the user whose problem you're solving to take responsibility for not engaging in the system. Right. And, right. and that is not the way I look at it. I believe I always, 
you know, err on the side of we're doing a bad job if they're not engaging. So when like you get low voting or participation rate in something, um, I think we often like castigate those people as they just simply don't care about the future and shit. Right. But like, I this don't brings up this brings, I want to bring this up. So if you look at, I just joined Twitter like two months ago, I created an account like a while ago, but just started using it because of this new yeah. dev thing. The most engaged posts on Twitter are the polls. Cause all you have to do is like click. You don't have to show anyone that you're liking something. You don't have to, all you do is like click the, the button and it, you, it increments the score of the thing that you voted for. And because it's so low friction, I think people are like very willing to do that. And we, if we take a look at, you know, Ethereum voting, like things where people have been requested to vote on contentious issues with their coins themselves, um, the participation rate is, is horrid. Um, mm -hmm. And you see kind of exchanges and miners dominate them just because like they're willing, they're, they're so incentivized to participate in that process that they will do it. But um, I think this goes back to an earlier point of not exactly knowing what your transactions are doing when you're interacting with Ethereum. And it's like, okay, I'm not going to take the risk of voting on something I don't really care about if I have the, the chance to lose all my token, all my coins. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so yeah. like, why would I do that? <laughs> of course, yeah, that, that's a great point. Like, I mean, making your voice heard in a, in, a, in a governance discussion should not incur like needless financial risk. Yeah. And, and that- or Even just like the, the feeling that there could be like financial risk, even if, it's technologically or like fundamentally there is, you're not really putting anything at risk from a design standpoint. It will feel to yeah. a lot of people like something is at risk. And then there's a whole anonymity thing and privacy thing on top of this. Right. And anyway, I think that like just to wrap up, maybe this governance portion is like uh, identity is a major is where this intersects right like we're not go i don't believe in purely on chain voting with tokens right because that's a you know plutocracy waiting to happen right and that is why we have this huge problem underlying the ability to solve on chain governance is solving the identity problem to where we can have the civil resistance that doesn't require you know, holding a bunch of money 100%. to be civil resistance mechanism, right? Like, and that, you know, proof of unique human or proof of nearly unique human or, or, or nearly proof of unique human, however you want to phrase it, like, you don't have to be like 100% proof, which I don't think any system does. But, you know, I think we would be okay with like, it's 99.9% .9 likely that this address is only represents one human in this system. Right. Right. Or, or, or whatever human is holds this address, it's 99.9% .9 likely that they don't hold any of the other addresses. Like, I think if we can get there, then the door opens up to on-chain governance. Right? Well, like, I yeah. think I, this is something that I've thought about for a long time. And when I, when I first joined Consensus, like three years ago, I, I wanted to solve the identity problem through reputation. And I had like some unique solution mm -hmm. to do that. But, um, once cur we currently have to design all of our systems in the face of like, they all have to have civil resistance. Like, like we have to take civil attacks into consideration at like, you know, the consensus layer, everything we do ha has to make the assumption that we can't like map one person to one on chain identity. And mm -hmm. so if we can solve the identity problem and the proof of like unique human, we, and we ultimately solve the civil attack problem, then the, the, the mechanism design of all of these systems that we're doing gets so much easier. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. And so not, like, not only does it make that easier, but it opens up a world of possibilities of new use cases. And so it opens up what I think is the big solve is something like liquid democracy which is yeah. being able to defer my say in the system to somebody I trust on that topic, right? And that is what, if it, I can, you know, if we imagine deeper into the future that, you know, if this 
thing that's being voted on is somehow categorized as a, uh, in a, a security and encryption discussion, I know I can just go ahead and either defer, like I, they don't even have to tell me a vote's happening, right? Yeah. Like I, I just already have it preset in my preferences, however, I, however the user experience comes about for this, that for those things like that, I defer to, I don't know, somebody like Christian Lundquist, right? Like, and I'll let him spend my, you know, whatever, or say, give my voice um, on my, on, or he can speak on my behalf, essentially, right? I don't know if it's done with like special tokens for that vote or however it'll come together. But um, the point is, I think that that is the most, in theory, viable solution that I, I see. I agree. Yeah. And that is a rabbit hole that I absolutely want to dive down but we are already coming up on time. Um, we're going to have to have you back really soon to talk about that because I, I, I want to talk about that a lot. Um, <laughs> I want to, uh, there's, there's a, one last Go for it, man. Yeah, of course. take that I, I, this is something that I think that, uh, I don't know, hopefully it doesn't spiral us for too much longer, but my feeling, <laughs> and I was going to say this earlier, was the other hot take that I was alluding to, um, but is that, I see, I actually see like uh, ETH2 and the focus on it and all of that as a crutch and as a symptom of desperation on the part of the Ethereum community. Because I think that we are so afraid that we cannot find problem solution and product market fit with ETH1 that we have to dazzle people with new technical progress. And of oh, course, million that's percent. what we're going to get when the only people governing the system are devs, right? That's where they feel comfortable. They feel comfortable solving technical problems and not the other problems, which are the entire reason why all this work is being done, right? And that is like the thing that just, I'm like, feel like I'm biting my tongue. At I'm Dev so happy you said time, that. Right? Like, and it's like, I think there's plenty of use cases for which our scalability and our capacity and our throughput right now yep. could be good enough. 100%. And everybody leading these teams and everything has, it feels like has essentially just given up on any of those use cases because nobody wants to do the hard work of, user interviews and market research and iterating on prototypes. And they're like, you know what? Let's just keep building more and more technical things that don't involve us Dude, needing to do any of that. You're, you're speaking to my soul right now. So we, for, for Ethereal, we had this like Ethereum ecosystem growth panel. And it was like me, Kane, Cena, Austin Griffith, Rick Burton, and at the end, everyone went around and we, would, we did a random off topic hot take. And this was my hot take. I was like, oh, I watched it. Like, yeah, go ahead. Oh, shit. Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. No, I was saying go ahead. I hadn't, I meant to, oh. I have like a, that panel bookmarked as watch for later. In the oh, day. yeah, yeah. So at the end, yeah, I, I, I said <laughs> what I was trying to, I, you said it like well, but way better than I did. But like that was exactly what I was trying to say is we don't need, you know, Shamir secret sharing and ZK rollups and zero knowledge proofs and like way better transaction throughput to solve, like to find product market fit. Um, there is a lot of cool stuff we can do right now. And sure, you know, those problems need to be solved. Sure. There's people that should be working on them and I wholly, I'm wholly supportive of them and they're important things. But in the meantime, Layer one Ethereum can support some really interesting use cases. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of it comes down to user interface and user experience and design. And what we're seeing is, you know, things like try roll. I, I talk about this a lot, but it is so basic. It is just, it lets someone click a button basically and they get their own ERC 20 token. Mm -hmm. We could have done that five years ago, but they added yep. a nice user interface. And now it's like one of the most popular apps on Ethereum. Yeah. And so, yep. There's, there's so much to do. And we, I think it's almost an excuse that people have made that they're just like scared of failure. And so they're buying time with saying, oh, e we got to wait for ETH2. And it's like, no, we actually don't. Like, we're just, yeah. you just can't figure out how to build a, right, a proper product. <laughs> the crutch, it's like, there's a, there's a, 
there's a similar thing that happens in design. I've seen it tweeted as like an, on design Twitter as a meme a couple of times, but it's like, um, uh, I think the meme format was like somebody talking to their therapist and it's like therapist says, you know, like, um, okay, now what do we do when we feel anxious? And then the designer says, we've redesigned the website, right? And, and they're like, no, no, right? And, and the idea is designers have their own crutch, which is like, it's not about solving the problem. We just need like a new brand. We need new, you know, all that fun that we find fun, right? New logos, new swag. Like that's what we do when we are anxious a lot of times about not being able to solve the fundamental design problem. And this is the, de I see it, this is what the devs are doing exactly. here, which is yeah. like, they're anxious about the product not finding product market fit. So they find something they feel productive doing, which is like all this crazy shit, right? Like, and it's not yeah. that crazy. Like I understand, do understand a lot of it, but to other people, it's like, you know, like they, it's just like, yeah, it just seems very devoid, like untethered from, from, from what, from reality. It's like people yeah. are just trusting Coinbase and they don't even know that they're not supposed to trust Coinbase, but we're spending, we're, we're so worried about like VDF and all of that shit. Right. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. It's like, the priorities are wrong. I think that there's not enough design in any leadership and any teams around the space. If there were, we wouldn't see this as much. We probably would have better product market fit by now, but like we don't see a lot of crypto companies started by those people or funded, you know? And um, uh, so, yeah, I think that that's yeah. like, that's like a, I, I think you hit the nail on the head and this will, this will bring us kind of full circle. Um, I could talk about this forever too, but like we need way more de designers and product people like yeah. leading the product roadmap in our industry for all of the various products that we have. And I'm very thankful for uh, my time on Newport because I, I saw like firsthand kind of um, the failure of like technical led design decisions. And you just go down these rabbit holes that are, they're technically interesting. So I, I think it's, it's a number of different things. I think it's one, a fear of, of failure um, and people just operating where they're comfortable. Two, I think it's people doing stuff that they're like, like these devs and these deep math people, these cryptographers are interested in, like they're interested in solving these hard problems. Um, and then three is just misdirection. They just don't, like a lot of people don't really know and they just follow the herd and they're like, oh, we need scalability. Okay, we'll go do this. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think it's like a very multifaceted problem what like the reason for why these things are being heavily emphasized and other things aren't but yeah i th i think yeah i mean i agree that, Sorry, like, it's it's i think i'm not saying that every dev and cryptographer in the space one is this way or two um is is doing this right like is using it as a crutch or a hiding place you know a, you know some totally. people because I fall victim to the same thing I'm just saying in design, which is like, I like designing, doing design systems, right? And, you know, the components and all of that stuff, but that's not going to save whatever, it's not going to save Uport is if it's all we need is a design system, right? Like, it's, it's, that's like a means to an end, right? Like, and um, so, yeah, I think it's the, it's the, it's the, like you said, it's a fragmented motivations onto why this is happening, but regardless, it's happening. And, and I think it's, it, and to, to bring us back to like the point of governance, um, it's, it's, I think it's largely happening because we have a dev driven community because the beginning days of Ethereum were extremely technically focused. It was like, we needed to build something first before we could design anything on top of it or market it or do any of even have these product discussions. So like early Ethereum, there was none of this and it was just like, let's build the protocol. And so that has like the dev heavy or like low level protocol level dev mindset and leadership has carried forward into today, I think. 
And I think we, we're, we're nearing the point where we need a little bit of a shift over to of people who are like, just as a, as the Ethereum ecosystem in general, we need more of a, a focus of attention on uh, like actual users and, and yeah. act norm, normal people. Like we, we have like layer one Ethereum is pretty good and we're probably going to get layer two Ethereum relatively soon. Like mm -hmm. you guys keep crushing that, but also there's this whole other world that we, we, we now need to think about. We didn't have to think about it before, but now we have to think about it. And so like, <laughs> somebody put together a Google uh, sheet at one point, I probably still have a bookmark somewhere with where um, it was tracking uh, like in 20, I guess it was probably 2019 or 2018, um, all of the funding that had been given out to date by, um, by the Ethereum community. So stuff from Consensus, stuff from EF, some from Metacartel and Malak Dow and all of these like funding sources and grants programs, right? And when you look down that list of what the things that were funded and the, um, the I guess the uh, type of project, whether it was like a, like a development project or an encryption thing or whatever, you, it's plain, it's very plain to see why we don't have product market fit. Right. Yeah. Nothing's, <laughs> like, <laughs> nothing's being funded to make anything easier to use. Right. Like, yeah. The thing that I come, the thing that I always point out is like, what is what is the probably the best DEX in your opinion? Uh, I haven't explored them that much, but I just I actually earlier today used DYDX and it was okay. really it was pretty good. So I haven't used DYDX, but the one I hear all the time is Uniswap right now. Oh yeah, I mean I use Uniswap. All, that one's so easy, but like. I don't cons that's that's more like a I don't even view that as a dex although technically I guess it is it's I can see it as a you're it's just an exchange and they made it very easy to get they focused yeah. on a part of exchanging right like it's not it's not a dex in that it's not built for traders right um but it is a like I I see them as they can I guess my, the way this point leads back to design is that I find it interesting that we're building this shared backend, essentially, um, of Ethereum, and also will be thing. Well, the other part of the backend, hopefully, will be decentralized storage of some sort. Um, but once these things are shared public backends, the only defend, the mainly the only defensible part of these new products is at the user experience level because you don't own the data. You don't get to monetize the order book. Everybody has the same access to the same, like can have the same access to the order books, right? Like, right. and can have access to the same, like you don't get to monetize your storage of user information, right? Because it's not in a silo that you control that defeats the whole purpose. So once the backend data portion is shared on top of Ethereum and some layer two stuff and, um, and like decentralized storage, the only defensible position to take for new businesses and startups is at the application That's level. That's such a good point. Yeah. And, and in your product design. That's like, yeah. yeah. I, think, I think right now there is still no amount of scarcity of opportunity with respect to the building out of that backend infrastructure and the tackling of new and interesting use cases with like new Ethereum protocols, like sure. like app or smart contract layer protocols, and and what you're talking about is like once once that pool evolves, and it's getting to that point now. Like there's 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 a sufficient amount of Lego blocks to be able to compose them into like good products. Right now, I think there's still. A, almost an infinite amount of room to grow. So I think may, maybe that, that opportunity will never die. And mm -hmm. there will always be opportunity to build a new kind of uh, pro, like smart contract that does some new and interesting thing. Yeah. Um, but I, I think so. I think so too, in a way, but I, the thing, the way I, I was writing this article about decentralizing social media, and this is like what made me think of it, which is like, what does a social media company, if we can decentralize social media, 
what is it like the only it's not like you can't defend like twitter and facebook and linkedin that what their secret sauce their moat is in the siloing of the information right and that's why you don't leave them because you have to build your reputation from scratch and you have exactly to, right? now in a future where there is no friction to leaving and you get to take your reputation and all of your content and all of your followers and everything with you to some new platform the only thing to draw you one way or the other is how good the u.s totally. is. yep right great, and that's gonna point. happen that's gonna happen to a lot of like decentralized marketplaces they're all going to be the same they're all going to have access to the same smart contracts that have all the listing of the products or whatever right and or or the the hashes of pointers to decentralized storage where the listings are whatever it ends up being right but like everybody will be competing to build the same front a, a, a better front end right for interacting with that with the back end. totally yeah i love that you're so right <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, i mean i think that, that won't be for a while like you said I mean, uh, the, you know, the, the apocalypse of dev jobs is not coming anytime soon in blockchain <laughs> yeah. world. But um, I just think it's an interesting thing that like when we get to a place with, you know, shared backend infrastructure and databases in which, in which any front ends can read the state of those databases, front end becomes everything. Because the only thing people yeah. need to figure out. And you obviously like, don't worry, back end engineers, like, the front end engineer is going to need people to understand the smart contracts so that your front end can interact with them. So you're not going to be out of a job, but yeah, I think this, Oh, there's so many good points. We, we got to, we got to do one thing before we go on hit on is the fact that like we talked about needing to bring more product people and designers into the space. So this whole 1 million developers movement is a misnomer. We would just want um, 1 million builders in the space. And I, I view designers and product people as much, I know it's going to piss off like actual devs, but I view them as like developers too, especially because we're going to increasingly move to a world of like low code and no, no low code and no code solutions. And like AI is going to be doing a lot of the programming for us. I might not be anytime soon, but the de developers are not going to be like keep like keyboard monkeys. Like I'm not going to be like typing on my keyboard to develop something it's going to be a process of like design thinking and solving problems. Like that's mm -hmm. going to be a developer. And then you're going to tell the computer, it's like, Hey, I want it to do this. And then the computer will like write the code for you. Mm -hmm. That's, that's inevitably where we're going to go. And so, mm -hmm. um, like I kind of want to encourage people to maybe start training up in that skill set now. Like mm -hmm. I, I love, that's I'm glad I started the, the conversation with what is design because like everyone should be thinking about that. Like the way that you defined it, everyone needs that in their skill set and they're gonna need it increasingly more so as we kind of trend in this direction of building things not requiring like some of these other skill sets and more requiring like creative like good thought with respect to problem solving. Yeah. Uh, I would love to see, you know, our dev friends like, um, take the same approach that, that design has discovered and, and often, you know, like I said, lots of designers in the space, we like to say everybody's a designer, right? Like that's what design thinking is when you're in a workshop. It's like, everybody's just doing design, right? It's not that like, have to be a designer to do design and i don't know that i've heard that a lot from the dev community and the technical community definitely not no they're like you're not the developer get out of here <laughs> yeah and so i think that that's kind of we're gonna meet somewhere in the middle um and uh yeah i think you're right about like the low code and the no code and the only last point it kind of reminds me of is that if the whole point of all of this stuff that we're doing is to return control of systems back to individuals. Well, the, the place we're taking the control from, those places and organizations and institutions and people were purpose-built to wield that control, right? Like, right. 
and all of that complexity, right? What we're saying is we're going to, uh, we're going to say now that the, all of that decision making that they have been doing is now your responsibility now. And not giving them the every, all these new people, we have to give them now the tools to do, like manage that control, right? Well said, dude, yeah. And, you know, giving, I don't know, there's probably some good metaphor where it's like you can bring somebody to and show them and give them permission to have something, but they have like no, they don't have the tool to get it or whatever, right? Like it's like you could bring somebody to a, a horse pond. to water, but you can't make it drink the water or whatever the fuck. Right. Is. Well, yeah. <laughs> or like it doesn't have a tongue yet. You got to like give it a, <laughs> like right. a mouth. Like a, like a, like a, like a fishing rod, right? You bring somebody, they're starving. Here's all of this fish and no, they're right there, but no way to like interact with them. Right. And they're going to have to learn how to construct a fishing line and all of this shit, or they could just like go back right where there's less food, but at least like, it's like, (laughs) you know, there's, there's, that's how I, I feel about this space that we kind of missed sometimes. It's like, what do we just think everybody's going to become like a, like an expert in all of these things that we're returning control of to them, you know, like ridiculous. Oh, you're going to be able to control. Like I get this a lot in the identity space. Like you're going to be able to control your identity and manage your identity and all of the data that goes with it. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. Lots of people are like, yeah, that sounds like a, like I've got shit to do. Right. Like, okay, give it back to me. First thing I'm going to do is pay somebody to manage it for me. (laughs) Totally. Yeah. (laughs) And I worry about that with the money, right? We're going to give you control over all your finances. You'll be able to invest in whatever you want. And this thing will be in this financial instrument. First thing I do, re-centralize it with some other entity that will manage all my funds for me. Or buy a bunch of Tron and lose all my money. So anyway, we can, we could wrap it up, but this was fun. Yeah. I yeah. This was awesome, man. This was an amazing conversation. Um, thanks so much for joining Robbie. Yeah. Any, any closing, closing comments or questions? No, not at all. John, I really appreciate the time. And I totally agree with you, especially when it comes to like libraries and tools, such as like react studio, when we're going to start to see these, um, these formations between like design and front end development start to like merge a little more and code now being abstracted away where like a designer can do something. And as long as they, you know, stay true to the naming conventions, you can port everything out to let's say react or something. So right. and that- I, I want, I really want web flow for smart contracts, yeah. right? Like I already play around with remix and that stuff yeah. now. And I'm like, there already are these patterns. Yep. Right. Just What's- allow me to drag a module into a GUI and it's yep. like, this is the, the input for your tokens, right? What's, and, what's Denison Bertram's thing? He's got that, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah he's, 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 they're definitely like making progress on it. One of my, okay. that's, I'll shout them out as like, that's one of my favorite things happening in Ethereum. Like that while everybody's focused on ETH2, I'm like looking at that stuff thinking, thinking like this is, this is what the revolution starts to look like. Dude, and, and to that point, it's like, by doing that and by developing it goes back to this 1 million develop oh i just wow this is beautiful like we need to lower the barrier to entry of being a developer not by like making everyone a a code monkey but by giving them the tools they need to be a developer even if they're not a developer Mm -hmm. and so like the best way to get new ideas and creative thought and projects built on Ethereum is to lower that barrier of entry and get everyone, all these people, you have this pool of people who just can't write smart contracts Mm -hmm. and they're never going to take the time to learn. They don't give a shit. Mm -hmm. But if you can like give them the tools that they need to transform their thoughts into like to manifest their thoughts into code, Mm -hmm. then like everyone's a developer then we actually do can like 1 million developers is actually a realistic thing because right, mm-hmm. right now it probably isn't. <laughs> um, and, and like, wow, I don't know. That, yeah. Maybe that's what we just need to focus on is like the tools that make everyone a developer. Right. Yeah. You should be, ex- you should. Yeah. I mean, I don't think uh, there's so much focus on, which is good. It's focused on like education. Right. But like, right. Exactly. But, 
that's that's one part of it and of course we're always going to need some you know people that know everything of their down to the last detail but like man i I, don't want to learn dude like i don't want to either right i I don't want to yeah or or you even have just like a percentage of people that are curious to learn so they're gonna go and they're gonna take those edu- education classes to like elevate themselves in terms of what they can do but everyone outside of that spectrum you know is just gonna be like i have the idea but i'm not gonna sit through this and take the time to learn it the, so. the amount of years coming up in design that i've taken like html css and basic javascript courses like and just like i know it a little bit but like ultimately when it came down to like designing a website i was just like nah, yep. just, you know and like then webflow came along and i'm like this is fucking great just like i was such a i i you know i got metamask christian Geria on it like their sites built on webflow uport sites have been built on webflow like and that's a, it and Granted, the first attempt, people have been trying to build something like Webflow for years since Dreamweaver, and Dreamweaver sucked. And yeah, that's uh, sucked. but their mind was in the right place. Like, and you know, our first smart contract builder might suck, but you know, that's where it's got to get to, right? Like, yep. everybody is capable of constructing l- logical things. Yeah, right? exactly. That's all a smart contract is. It's like, don't bog me down with the syntax and make me figure out which Solidity thing I'm, you know, which version of Solidity I'm running. And, uh, you know, whether or not this, you know, if y'all change the way you do constructor functions and like all of that shit, right? Like we would so, have one million developers by now if we had <laughs> yeah. that problem. And, and I think this, so we need to like, just as humanity in general like we need to reduce the lead time between like thought or idea and the manifestation of that thought or idea in the real Mm -hmm. world um Mm -hmm. and like code is just one example um but like everyone has everyone has these interesting ideas and they just don't know how to like take those ideas and create like do something with them and Mm -hmm. I, i almost feel as if it's almost like a a futile it's like a very suboptimal task so I'm going to, I just saw this. So this is probably the worst analogy ever or metaphor, whatever you call them. But like, we're like building a ship. And as pe- new people come to work on the ship, we like have them work on the pieces of the ship without tools. And, and it, like when, when people come to work on the ship, we should instead be like, hey guys, when you come in, let's build a saw. Or let's build a hammer so that we can like build the ship faster and better. But we're like trying to hammer shit with our hands. <laughs> like, like people are coming into the ship and we're just like <laughs> trying to saw shit with our teeth. <laughs> it's like, yeah. no, you gotta, you gotta first build the tools to build the ship. And so maybe that's what. <laughs> but there's, there's only a few people that have all of the knowledge to build True. that saw. Yeah. But yeah. once they build that saw, there are so many people that know intuitively how to use the saw, right? Like that's, yeah. I think what makes it real for me. And, um, and it's almost like recursive because, you know, and it, I think it's like a stepping stone. It's like, okay, there's this guy, there's the Austin Griffith who knows everything. He mm-hmm. builds like this thing. Then this thing is used to build this thing. And this thing is used to build this thing. So I don't think you need to go from here to here right. immediately. I think the, the, the knowledge gets like trickled up or down whichever yeah, direction that, you want to go like that's another project that seems like it's headed the right direction is like that ETH build stuff that yeah Austin's doing 100%. right like all of that stuff i think is to me i find i'm again biased i'm a designer but like to me i'm like that's what makes me love ethereum not necessarily a lot of the ETH 2 stuff right like i you know i do trust them and it's important and all of that but like this is where like the the things start to come together and that is like for people actually accomplishing the goals that ethereum wanted to empower them to do um is stuff like yeah that um dap hero and the eth build stuff what they're doing yeah the, the promotion of accessibility i totally agree with you that's that's everything yeah i mean where is their million dollar check like i you know i don't know 
like if I like not to put the EF on blast, I don't know, maybe they have like funded them in some way that I just don't know about. Um, but like, if man, like it seems like they are, should, would be heavily incentivized <laughs> to fund those projects. Right. Yeah. Um, so anyway, the last parting thought I'll, I'll leave you with, which, you know, you, I'm sure you guys saw the JK Rowling stuff on, on Twitter. Um, there was one of her tweets that I have saved that just like encapsulates. It <laughs> was it like the blah, blah, blah. No, it was, it was, uh, I don't want to program money. I can barely work my TV. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> and Very true. Like, there you go. Like, no, nobody wants to program money, right? Like, that is, they, they're still trying to figure out the problems from Web 2 and uh, how to set up their Facebook profiles and manage their privacy settings in a centralized experience. Like, it's, we have to put more, more focus there. On that note, Johnny, that was fucking amazing. Um, let's do it again soon. Cause yeah, man, have me. I'm happy to come back anytime. Maybe we can do uh, an identity focused one. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, we unfortunately didn't get to identity, but uh, maybe we'll focus on that next time because that is the deepest of rabbit holes. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's going to get real spicy real quick. Um, yeah. But yeah, this was Ethereum Hot Takes 11. Um, Maybe I, I would say this is this is up there in the running for one of the best ones yet. So um, thank you again. Um, right, man. Glad you had me, Robbie. Do you have your soundboard still up? Do you have like a closing? I no, I killed it. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, it's okay. <laughs> I'll imagine it. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine like cheers and horns. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs>